today. I'm going to demonstrate this in a peculiar way, I think, because I'm going to start by telling you a story. And the reason I'm going to do that is because models of the world that include phenomena like consciousness and emotions and motivations and actions and interactions are generally portrayed formally in stories and not in scientific theories. And it does turn out to be that stories themselves have an identifiable structure, even a grammar that makes them comprehensible. Furthermore, it turns out that even the simplest stories, especially if they're elegantly constructed, have an unbelievably profound underlying meaning. And you can frequently see this most particularly in children's stories. So, I remember I showed my son when he was four years old the Disney movie Pinocchio, which on the surface of it is a very strange tale, right? It's a wooden puppet who wants to become real, so he has to rescue his father from the belly of a whale. A structure that could by no means be considered rational That is in fact so surprising and unexpected That it's remarkable to imagine that grown men and women Including children Can sit in a movie theater And watch a story like that unfold Without ever thinking for a second That it's absolutely peculiar That they can be taken in by such a tale And regard it experientially as real Pinocchio is a deep, deep story it it has echoes that go back three or four thousand years to the earliest stories that we know and it's so rich with information that a child can watch it over and over and over and over I think my son watched Pinocchio thirty times uh, Why? Well, it's either because a child can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality or it's because there's something to those stories that's much more potent than we actually consciously understand and It's kind of interesting too, you know, if you go to a if you go to a video rental Establishment, you find that in the top ten highest grossing movies of all time are four Disney movies that are animated fairy tales, essentially retelling of mythological stories. They strike a deep chord. Why? Well, Shakespeare, who is of course a great literary figure, said it perhaps better than anyone else has, which is not surprising because he said many things better than anyone else has. He said, All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely players They have their exits and their entrances And one man in his time plays many parts And so, following from that, you can imagine that a story Is no more about the props In the world Than a play that you go see is about the props on the stage A drama is about the manner in which people actually exist The emotions that they feel, the motivational states they encounter The problems they have to solve when they interact with each other And the play is the thing from that particular perspective in which we can capture those aspects of our experience that are not only real but essentially human I'm going to tell you a little story to begin this off with it's a kid's story written for children of about four years of age but it's very very elegant I, I tried to sh cut it down for this talk but I found I couldn't because it was so well edited that every single piece of it had to fit in to make the story complete and I'm going to show you first the structure of the story now this is a very useful Diagram in many ways. It's very simple. Basically, it says this Whenever you're doing anything You inhabit a bounded world now, you know like for example you're sitting here in this lecture There's things you are paying attention to and things you're not if I took most of you out of this room right now and asked you Definitively what color the rug was you wouldn't know or what color your chair was for example Or what the person next to you was wearing unless that person happens to be your husband or your wife you wouldn't remember any of those things And the reason for that is when you're in a situation like this and you're attending to a speaker Most of the occurrences that are unfolding around you are irrelevant You don't store them, you only focus on certain things Well, how do you decide what to focus on given that there's a virtually unlimited number of things to pay attention to? Well, you have to conceive of yourself as being somewhere Always And you have to conceive of yourself as going somewhere So you could say in in a real sense, the world you inhabit is a journey It's a journey from point A to point B A journey from what is to what should be A journey from the place you are, which is insufficient in some important manner To a place that in some important manner is going to be better A standard story has exactly that structure A child comes home and you say, well, what happened to you today on the way to school? Setting up the little narrative structure And the child will unfold the sequence of events that he encountered If the story is more interesting than just a recount of exactly what happened to him It usually involves the encounter with something unexpected on the way to point B And a description of the manner in which that encounter with the unexpected was resolved Typical story 
Now, why would you want to know that? Why would you want to listen to it? Well, it's because on your journey from point A to point B, all sorts of unexpected things always happen. And if someone else has encountered something unexpected and conjured up a decent solution to it, it could well be worth your time to listen. Well, maybe there's a pattern to encountering unexpected things. Maybe there's a proper way to encounter the unexpected. Maybe it's the case that in our collective wisdom as human beings, we've gathered up representations of ways to encounter the unexpected that we put forth in our stories. 